Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about clinical metagenomic sequencing, um, which is a project that has been in the pipeline for pretty much since I started as a registrar here at UCT um, and was somewhat modified when uh, the COVID pandemic hit us. So what, what were the aims of this, of this study? So um, I will get into exactly what metagenomic sequencing is, but very basically we wanted to assess what the clinical utility of metagenomics on, um, uh, in patients with CNS pathology was as a diagnostic tool, which was then later modified to individuals potentially with COVID-19. So the sub aims being development of a feasible workflow so that this could be implemented in a clinical lab. Um, and then once that was done to identify pathogens other than SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-2 in individuals presenting um, with uh, potentially as uh, COVID-19 and then further aims to characterize the host genotype um, and whether this can be used as a prognostic tool in determining um, how a patient is likely going to uh, progress during their admission and further to characterize the host transcriptome. So what is the host doing? Um, what, what is the immune response doing when this patient presents with CNS pathology? So the study, um, uh, enrollment happened over about a year um, with uh, 47 participants being enrolled um, at the completion. The 47, the number was, was based on the, the lab laboratory workflow. So that was complete enrollment. Um, the inclusion criteria was for an individual to present with a CNS, um, CNS pathology, um, including myelitis, meningitis, encephalitis, or encephalopathy, um, and be either a PUI primarily or have a confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, any, uh, well, any adults and um, any sex, as well as patients having to receive CSF sampling as part of their standard diagnostic investigation. So CSF needed to be taken as part of standard of care. And then we didn't include anyone admitted under the Mental Health Care Act. Um, and of course, um, if no consent was given or withdrawn. So ultimately we included 23 people um, with the clinical or molecular diagnosis of COVID-19, 24 who were suspected initially, but ultimately tested negative and were just deemed not to have uh, COVID-19, and nine were excluded due to not meeting inclusion after, being, after the case being identified or um, after withdrawal of consent. So clinical metagenomic sequencing, what, what exactly are we doing? What are, what are we talking about? So when we get the CSF sample, the, the, the study, we initially stored all the samples so that we could do the testing as a batch. But the goal of the test is to characterize all nucleic acids in a sample. So that'll include bacterial genomes, um, the host DNA from immune cells, the host RNA from immune cells, protozoal DNA, viral with a RNA genomes or DNA genomes, all those nucleic acids. The goal is to sequence them and uh, generate massive files of, of reads, which can then be in, interrogated for to determine what is in them. So very basically, it starts with nucleic acid extraction. Um, this is followed by library preparation. So library preparation means that the DNA or RNA after it's been converted to DNA um, is barcoded so that the sequencer can essentially recognize which reads belong to which samples. And then sequencing we did on a MySeq instrument, which is in the um, clinical laboratory here at Kyiv. So once all that read dot, all that DNA data has been generated, the very important data analysis step um, is what follows. So it has multiple steps. So it starts with raw, raw sequencing data cleaning. So essentially we trim all the bad quality reads or um, reads that had errors. 
And then very importantly, what we do is we map initially for the pathogen identification step, we remove any human DNA so that when the later classifier um, is, is classifying what, whatever pathogen reads are in there, um, we only have non-human DNA. And then obviously for the, the host transcriptome and host um, genome character, uh, genotype characterization later, um, that step is not done. So what uh, pipelines did we use? Uh, we used the Kraken 2 pipeline. Um, and then the images that I show you later have, have been generated with the, uh, the program Pavian, which is a metagenomic um, a genome uh, visualizer. So what does Kraken exactly do? So the technical part of the, of the talk is almost over. So um, um, Kraken, what, what it does is, so the query sequence you see right at the top, that is the DNA read that the sequencer is now pulling out of the CSF sample. So it, it seems, it, you, you might ask, well, why, why don't we just see what that is? Well, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that because ultimately we don't know what it is. What, we don't know what that sequence is. And the NCBI database of all uploaded genomes is massive. So I don't know if, if anyone has ever blasted something, um, it takes quite a while for that single read query to come back and for it to tell you, well, this was what was in that sample. So now imagine doing this for millions of reads, which is what each of these samples is gonna generate, millions of pieces of DNA that were sequenced. So what the Kraken pipeline does is it breaks that sequence into little parts and then instead of having a database that says, well, this genome belongs to this organism, um, what it does is it takes those parts, which are called KMERS um, of a specific length, and it generates a KMER of every possible combination, and then links each KMER to all the possible species that have that piece of DNA in it. And then when the query, the query sequence is essentially then broken up into DNA fragments that are of that same size, and then it, what it comes down to is the sum total of classifications for all those small parts is then generates a weighted average to determine what, what the most likely taxonomic classification of the query sequence is going to be. And that's the technical bit done. So we sequence it, we clean it, we map to human to remove all the human reads, and then we classify it taxonomically to see what reads are left what pathogens are there. So this is what a data output will most likely look like. So this is the positive control that we ran. And very importantly, with any molecular test, you need a positive control because you need to know that you're putting in stuff, can you get it back out? So as you can see here, this positive control had a, a variety of viruses, um, human mast adenovirus, human beta herpes virus, human alpha herpes virus, so HSV, um, human alpha herpes virus, varicella virus, um, as well as um, a whole bunch of other stuff which comes, which is most likely related, what, what was most likely in that positive control, but um, was not necessarily what we were looking for. But I'll talk more about that later. So the second very important um, element that needs to be included in metagenomic sequencing is the water control. So we need to know what DNA is inherently present in that kit. What DNA is inherently present in the environment? What DNA is not relevant? So as you can see here, this is a water control. This, this was not from a patient and we still detected a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of, a lot of which, let's say for example, look at Paraburcaldaria fungorum, um, which is an environmental contaminant. And that may well be present um, as part of one of the reagents or as, as part or, or present in the lab itself and not necessarily relevant if we now detect that specific organism in patients. And you'll see with the patient printouts later. So let's look at the first case that we applied this methodology to. 
So Mrs. N, 30, a 35 year old female, um, initially presented on the 29th of October to GSH neurosurgery with a one month history of headache, diplopia and confusion with a GCS of 13 out of 15. She was newly diagnosed with HIV with a CD4 of 180. CT imaging showed features of ventriculitis, basal meningeal enhancement and hydrocephalus. A VP shunt was inserted by neurosurgery and she was started on empiric TB treatment having had a negative or with a negative gene expert. Um, and, pre and started on prednisone and discharged. She represented approx approximately 20 days later with confusion and hemiparesis. At this point, the SARS-CoV-2 PCR was positive on, on a respiratory sample, which is why she was identified to the study. Over the course of her admission, she required more VP shunt revisions and an eventual CSF versus PCR um, about a month later, or well, a month after primary presentation, came back positive, prompting co-trimox therapy. So we tested the CSF of this patient with the metagenomic sequencing, and what did we find? So the two printout, the one on the left and the one on the right, that is representative of the databases that we used. So the, what, what organisms we are looking for. So on the left is viruses and bacteria, and on the right is eukaryotes. So on the left, you'll see things that are very similar to the water negative control. There you see Parabercaldiria fungorum again. We see Cutibacterium acnes, and Mayothermus sylvanus, probably all things related to the kit or the environment in the lab. But on the right, almost all of the reads look that we classified against the eukaryotic database showed Toxoplasma gondii. So quite, a, quite a very unlikely to be a contaminant is almost all the reads classified to that organism. So just to give you a better idea of the one on the left, where we found a whole bunch of things, but none of them which we really consider significant, all the DNA um, that, that goes into that sample is not necessarily significant. It may be picked up by sample handling in the lab or the ward. It may be present in the reagent manufacturer equipment. For example, nitrogen fixing bacteria tend to form biofilms in deionized water, which is very important to molecular biology. So actually a specific organism called Brady rhizobium is often present as a contaminant in, um, in refs, even in RefSeq databases as the definitive genomes of organisms, because they are picked up during sequencing and they're assumed to be part of that organism that is being sequenced. Then also environmental, such as lab surfaces, DNA contamination in the sequencing tubing. This can happen a lot if you, for example, are sequencing a specific organism um, on multiple samples, because the DNA, most of the DNA going through the sequencer will be the same. And then obviously skin flora during sampling. So that is why it is so important to do a water control and to also compare what you find between different samples and within your lab over time so that you can get an idea of what is likely significant and what is not. So in terms of case one, um, this was of course, this was certainly a, a failure of standard operating procedure of what, how that patient might, should ideally have been managed. But essentially we, if, if metadronic sequencing had been implemented as a essentially physician aid in terms of um, detecting everything present in a sample, it may well have resulted in toxoplasmosis being identified earlier and possibly improving neurological outcome. So case two, 53-year-old Mr. M diagnosed in July 2018 with a myelodysplastic syndrome admitted in October 2020 for a stem cell transplant, had subtle mental changes noted on the 27th of December and became blind and immobile on the 2nd of Jan, um, with a decreased consciousness documented on the 5th. MRI showed multiple ring enhancing lesions and amphotericin B was started empirically about a month after the initial mental changes. Fungal cultures never showed any growth. A post-mortem showed CNS angioinvasive um, angioinvasive septate fungal hyphae with acute angle branching, morphologically resembling aspergillus. But this was unfortunately a post-mortem. 
So what did we find here? So again, on the, on the bacterial and the viral database comparison, we mostly found skin contaminants, environmental contaminants. But on the right, in the eukaryotic, we found Aspergillus fumigatus. So, and this can cause invasive mold infections. While it was fewer reads than was present um, with the toxoplasmosis, PCR identification as well in, in CSF is not optimal, but the fact that we did detect it is quite significant because we, for example, have not detected that in any other sample that we've tested thus far. So it not, does not seem to be an environmental or a lab or a kit specific contaminant. So we would generally have considered this significant. And then Malassezia restrictor, we also tend to find quite commonly in other samples, which you'll see later. So it's impossible for us to know whether Aspergillus DNA would have been present in the CSF had it been taken at the onset of symptoms. Um, but if that had been the case, a suspected diagnosis of an invasive aspergillosis might have resulted in earlier treatment with antifungal therapy. So let's look at the next case. A 32-year-old male, newly diagnosed HIV, CD4-236, presented with a wake-up stroke, um, left dense hemiplegia, left hemicentury lost, uh, left extinction, left partial anopia, and dysphagia, lies at nine hours and 14 minutes. He was managed on admission as a case of a right tacky syndrome, neurosyphilis, um, was presumed, but a VDRL was unavailable at the time and a presumed TB meningitis, but TB, gene and gene, TB culture and gene expert were negative. The SARS-CoV-2 PCR ultimately was negative. So here, looking at the bacterial and viral pathogens, we see treponema pallidum was identified in the CSF. It was a single read, but again, this is not, tends, does not tend to be something that we detect in other sample or in the lab. And then in the eukaryotic or environmental pathogens, we only found Malassezia restrictor, which we find, tend to find in most samples. So the finding of treponema pallidum definitely supports the presumed diagnosis of neurosyphilis. Because we found so few reads, it might not have been sufficient to, to say it's a definitive diagnosis. But um, also significantly, we also did not find any reads mapping to, tuber to tuberculosis. But the relative sensitivity and the utility of metagenomic sequencing in TB meningitis is, is still to be determined. And then lastly, case four. So a 29-year-old male admitted on the 15th of April, known ALL on treatment with methotrexate and 6-mecaptopurine, um, presented with a week of lethargy, fever, headache, neck pain, and according to admission notes, diarrhea. Blood cultures came back positive for Listeria innocua. CSF showed no growth, but a Listeria monocytogenes was detected on our reflex bacterial meningitis PCR. Um, SARS-CoV-2 ultimately was negative. So here on the bacterial and viral database comparison, we found Lo and behold, Listeria monocytogenes with quite a lot of reads, numerous reads mapping to Listeria. So this, based on the number of reads and the mapping to that genome, this would be much more definitive than, for example, the um, treponema pallidum in the previous sample, in the other patient sample. And again, mostly environmental and skin flora in the other, in the eukaryotic database and further in the bacterial database comparison. So while in this case, metagenomic sequencing would not have altered clinical care, what is significant here is that the sensitivity was improved over CSF culture um, in detection of hysteria monocytogenes and would have been useful um, had, we, did we, had we not had a reflex PCR because our blood culture initially called it a listeria innocua. So how viable is this test though to implement in a clinical lab so i did a bit of investigation in terms of the price list various tests that we do so on the left is a quite the 
out of keeping if someone admitted, for example, with encephalitis to an ICU, um, who is possibly immunocompromised. So including an HSV, PCR, VZV, EBV viral load, CMV viral load, TB gene expert and a meningitis PCR. If you add all of those up based on the most recent 2020 NHLS price list, it's 4,888 Rand. Compare that, for example, to the cost um, to sequence samples that I found in this study, which would probably be able to be lower if the batch size, for example, is adjusted or if large volumes of reagents are ordered. Um, the cost per sample I found or in this study was 4,800. So not the really unfeasible, especially if you if you're getting to a situation where the diagnosis is still unknown, unknown and you're racking up multiple tests, um, all of which individually are much less than the metagenomic sequencing, but um, when, com when combined, it may end up being a relatively cost-effective test. So what are the next steps? So we're still busy sequencing all the samples. Um, we're about 40% complete with the sequencing. Um, then the bioinformatics phase starts. So I've done some prelim analysis, which, which is what, what I've shown you now for the samples that have been sequenced. Um, but what we still need to look at is more in-depth analysis, for example, to look for pathogens that possibly are previously not identified. Because for example, we use databases. So for us to find something, it has to be in the database. And there are ways in which you can assess whether um, reads belong to an organism close, but not yet described. And then further, we have to look at human DNA and RNA to look at the transcriptome and possibly um, human genotypes associated with specific disease, which is what will be the subject of my intended PhD. Um, and then putting it all together at the end, we'll be um, looking at the clinical data, the sequencing data, and standard diagnostic test, diagnostic test, and just to acknowledge the funding from the Oppenheimer Trust and Polio, uh, my lightest research foundation, medical micro, medical viro, and of course, neurology. Ram, thanks very much indeed. Um, fantastic you. talk and very exciting, um, very exciting uh, data. Um, I'm sure there are many questions and if colleagues do want to um, ask a question, if you could raise your hand on the chat on the participants list and please put your video on when you're asking. Um, so just a couple of a uh, couple of questions run in your case too just a clinical issue well an issue of interpretation i mean you called aspergillus um, obviously because there's a risk um, there's risk factors and the reads were there when they shouldn't have been but so was fusarium like you seem to have discounted that which had more reads than the aspergillus i mean how why why aspergillus not fusarium so Let me just have a look at the case two. So the, the fusarium didn't ID down to the species level. So um, if, so the, well, let, let me just, uh, let me just show, open that quickly so I can give you an idea. Um, so the fusarium, if you see here right at the bottom, there's an, the S. That, that is the reads that are ID down to the species level. So the fact that it was here under fusarium, it suggested that the read may well be falling in that um, genus, but it, it was not of a sufficiently high match that it could identify down to species level. So in the, the case of such as this, what you tend to do is to the genomes in question, then you manually inspect how good is the alignment? Is this possibly aligning to, for example, conserved regions in that fungal um, genotype, which might be present in multiple organisms? 
Um, so you, and then you, you generally find that it's a conserved region and that's why it couldn't ID it down to species level. And that this also, for example, might map to a, a whole variety of both environmental as well as medically important fungi. So Sorry. it's, it, it's ultimately, it's how good the ID is, is, is what's, is what's important in this case, why I called it Aspergillus rather than Fusarium. Great. And, and just one other quick question for me there. In your costing, I mean, does the bioinformatics cost? So it, it, de it depends. So probably in setting up, say, yeah, work, but the ideal is for any diagnostic clinical assay to have a fully or near fully automated analysis pipeline um, because you don't want a scientist and analyzing like from a scientific perspective um each sample you want a input and an output so setting it up yes but ultimately at the end it should be an automated pipeline that gives you an a result rather than okay no great um we've got um uh, on. we've got a question from um Sitandiwe first and then Sean. Sitandiwe, do you want to answer a question? I'll ask a question, sorry. If you could. Oh, hi, yes. Um, your, so I was going your, to um, ask. Video on, please. Okay. Just a second. Okay, lovely. Thanks. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, in terms of the organisms where you saw um, a low number of reads, is there like a, a threshold of some sort where you can say, okay, if we have um, a minimum of X amount of reads that have mapped to the database, um, that the organism actually is present in the sample? Um, or is it just a, okay, there's a low number of reads, so we might have to do further, di um, further diagnostic tests to confirm the presence of that organism? So yes to both. Um, so ultimately, if the reads are low, what you would first look at, at look at is what is the percentage. So of the total number of reads for this for this um, sample, how many? What percentage map to um, that that organism? Because obviously, the sequencer, depending on the cellularity of the CSF, depending on how many samples are multiplexed, um, all, all of those might impact how many reads are detected. The second thing that you need to see is that read, how specifically does it map? So you manually map the reads to the organism that you are presumptively IDing. If it's mapping to regions that are conserved and unique to that organism, that might carry more weight. And then lastly, yes, if, if um, all of those measures don't meet a threshold, which is determined by your lab in lab validation to comparing it to your standard techniques, um, if it doesn't meet those criteria, what you would do then ideally do is a confirmatory test, such as a, a real time PCR or something looking at a different region to the one that that was picked up. That, that would be the, in a ideal, in the ideal way to go through that. Great, uh, thanks. Sean? Thank you. Um, thanks for a great talk, Ron. Um, so in all of the cases, except for the patient with invasive fungal infection, who actually was on the correct and correct therapy when he died, and I don't think we've changed his outcome. Um, the diagnosis was made with conventional methods, right? And even for suspected fungal infection, they are targeted PCR or targeted sequencing approaches that are available. Um, and so, I mean, it didn't actually seem like this approach added that much clinical value to, uh, to the existing tests, which are part of the kind of normal lab workflow um, that can be interpreted really easily. Um, and so, you know, plus the interpretation of these um, outputs from, you know, from, from the metagenomic sequencing, it seems very complex. Um, and so I was also going to ask you about the bioinformatics and what the potential for automating that in a kind of more useful clinically interpretable way is. And, and then also like ultimately, if you do get this to work, if you can like automate it, 
um, like where you see its value. Um, I mean, it seems to me based on what you presented that the value would be in um, cases where you don't have a diagnosis by conventional methods and you're looking for something unusual. Thanks, Sean. Okay. So, Roy. So, a few questions there. So, yes, um, a aspergillus PCR would be better, but we don't have an aspergillus PCR. Um, Including the, the the value here is that if it is equi if it is if it meets equivalence, it's the equiv it's pretty much like saying we have a PCR for every possible pathogen that you can imagine that it removes having to validate hundreds upon hundreds of different assays, which is very difficult and complicated and costly to to do. So if it if it meets meets equivalence to or even not slightly not as good as a an individual PCR, I would still argue it adds value. So the other thing is, is yes, that patient with um, with the invasive aspergillus eventually was on the correct therapy, but there was a month where it was not considered. Um, where if you have a test that is more broadly able to identify more pathogens, which can be implemented early in high risk patients. And that leads to the, the second part of your question is when and how to implement it. Um, I agree, it, it definitely shouldn't be something that is just done for everyone, but arguably patients with neurological symptoms of with the hematological malignancy or patients presenting with a neurological abnormality or CNS pathology requiring ICU admission, I would argue that the costs involved in those patients and the potential for, for poor outcomes would outweigh the, the potential costs. Okay, so no, thanks. Okay, so, sorry, I'm gonna to have to move this along. Adrian, a very quick last comment or question. Um, thank you, Ruan, thank you, Mark. I think um, to answer, I think your questions are all valid. I don't think it's for every patient. There might be certain CNS infections and even lung infections and other infections down the line that would that the tests are negative and you are investigating an infectious disease of sort. Um, the other thing which we which perhaps initially will be a research um, tool is the moment you get to the transcriptome and some easy way of analyzing the mRNA and other RNA viruses um, in the brain um, that will only take you know, will only know how quickly that could be done once all the RNA extractions have been taken place. But I think perhaps initially from an RNA point of view, a research tool, otherwise um, very defined infections in different um, samples. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ruan. Great. Thanks very much. And thanks, Ruan, for a really excellent presentation. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to move over now to our colleagues, uh, to Dr. Rai, uh, for the next presentation from Neurology.